Hello, my name's Tony Wilson and by means of an introduction I'll just tell you a little bit of my background. Um, I actually helped to rewrite the technology curriculum document. Uh, that's got to be some 15, 16 years ago. Uh, I was a teacher for seven years in primary schools. Uh, I lectured in early years communication and curriculum and technology. Um, I've also been a storyteller for the last eight years. Well, this whole project is linked to technology involved with Jack and the Beanstalk. And what I'm going to show you is a, a series of techniques, some conventions and a few processes that some of you may already know. Uh, and I know that some of you will use them already. But what I'm doing is I'm assuming that I'm going from a complete novice when it comes to technology to try and build your confidence and to also to give you a serial and understandable logical um, progression through all of the different kinds of uh, technological processes that you can use. I've got to say that all of the things that I'm going to show you I've actually used when I was in the classroom and when I've been teaching and all of the different processes and all of the techniques are actually linked so I'm not just showing you these out of badness just to try and get you to do things it's more or less to show you why when we come to paint something a little bit later on um, that you understand exactly why you use a particular series of colours or why you have a convention of the light coming from one point. So all of these techniques are linked and we're going to go from drawing to shading to 3D representation, paper modelling, gluing, sticking, cardboard and paper structures. We're also going to make paper and cardboard girders and once you've got the confidence to make these kind of things then you'll be able to get the confidence to show your pupils how to do them and it's going to be a combination of skills hopefully in a logical and enjoyable progression and along the way you never know we might even come across just a little bit of art so i hope you enjoy it Right, first things first, uh, a lot of the, the techniques I'm going to be showing you, you will be actually looking over my shoulder as I actually draw or paint or make things with papier-mâché or glue things. So really what I want to show you first and foremost is how to represent something in three dimensions. Now this is important because uh, for the older pupils we're going to be looking at how they record the structures that we make and how to look at and understand the way that uh, a design looks, a way that a design um, a specification looks. Well, if we were to try and draw a box, I'm sure we'd all be able to make a fairly good stab at it. And what you have is you would draw a square, like so. And that looks pretty good. Now, the convention is that the light comes from the top right, uh, top right hand corner. So if you imagine that the sun is coming from that side and then you would look at and you think that all right this side is going to be darkest because it's furthest away from the light. Now I'm using quite a heavy pencil. This is a 5B. And straight away that starts to give this two-dimensional representation of a square just a little bit of body, a little bit of structure. And then you would draw, I know that some people have uh, are used to drawing a wire diagram by drawing one square and then another square and rubbing lines out. But if you look at it, you've got the light coming from the top right hand side, this side, so that's going to get the, the light the last, so that's going to be dark. And that becomes dark as well. And that becomes dark. And so does that. And now you start to get quite a, a representation of darkness and depth and you've got this is the furthest away that is the closest and that is about halfway between the two and you've got something that starts to look a little bit like a three-dimensional um, a three-dimensional cube this is all well and good but it's not particularly accurate and really what I want to show you are techniques that are going to improve the accuracy of your drawing now if you're thinking that the color comes from the top right hand corner 
and comes towards this cube, the lightest face is going to be that one. The second lightest is going to be that one, and the darkest one will be the one that's actually closest to us. So instead of just having a square, we now have what looks to, to our eye uh, as, as if it is a, a cube. So if I use quite a dark colour here, and we have red as quite a thick colour, and crosshatch on top of that, you're now starting to get a bit of depth to the colour and the way that it looks. And you've got this, uh, the top face uh, is yellow. All of these techniques are really meant to try and fool the eye, to try and get the eye to look at something that's in two dimensions and interpret it as if it is in three dimensions. And this side, well, I've got to say that well, what we are using with the whole of the Jack and the Beanstalk story is that everything that's at the bottom of the beanstalk has a tone of red to it because that's where the brick house is. And this is a, a direct representation and linkage between a colour and a position within the story. And at the top of the beanstalk where there's the gold and the sun, we have a yellow. And where it's the beanstalk, strangely enough, we have green. And if you look... Now we have something that fools the eye into looking at it and thinking that this could well be a solid object. Because you have light at the top, not so light here, and closest to us and furthest away from the light in a dark colour. Now, and what you could do is, and this comes again when we're looking at the, the way that we're going to use the different um, ways of recording the, uh, the clothing of the giant and other characters when we come to look at how we're going to draw the uh, girders and the boxes that we'll make what you could do is you could take a felt tip pen and on those edges that are furthest away from the light you draw a thick line and that fades out and in the same way as you regard the lines, that these ones furthest away are lighter, you shade in in the same way, so that it is darker at the bottom left-hand corner, and then that fades out. And that hopefully shows you how you can actually use colour to try and represent something in three dimensions. And you can do the same again. With this you would draw like a pretty dark line at the side, and you'd get that shading to fade towards the top right hand corner closest to the light. Like that. And again with the yellow, hard lines furthest away. And it fades away towards the top right hand corner of the drawing. And that's how you would do it freehand. Now freehand's all well and good if you have the confidence to try and draw a straight line. A lot of children find themselves um, almost uh, frightened by pencils or frightened by making a mark. Uh, and I quite often ask children, I say, well, what did you do at school today? I did some reading and I did some arithmetic and I did some rubbing out. And they spend more time rubbing out because they don't seem to have the same kind of confidence in, in applying a mark. Well, I'm going to show you something that if you try it and then you show it to children, they will have confidence in, in their own marker making. And this is something that's used a lot within design and technology. This is called a grid, purely and simply a piece of graph paper on which I've scored out with a, a thick felt tip pen on top of each of the squares so that you have a regular, I think it's one, two, three, four, a ten by twelve. Uh, grid and you take a piece of paper and you put it on top now there is a point to this because when this is finished you will be able to get the children to make a display and there's no point in us doing something that's supposed to be design and technology and rather than just do it freehand 
what you should be able to see it might not come come across so much on the video but what you should be able to see through this ordinary uh, photocopying paper you should be able to see the grade through it and what you do and again I'm using quite a quite a heavy uh, pencil here this is a, a 5b so that the, the marks will come up a little bit clearer on the drawing but you would put a dot to show where you're going to start and if we make it so that it's going to be a square that is four by four I'll just make a small dot like that and you take a ruler and you draw on top of it now again you've got to think that what I would do is I draw a faintish line there again I would draw another line here quite faint now for children who find themselves scared of actually making a mark to do something by using a ruler and a grid it takes away that element of chance it's very accurate and it does come out as a very clean line straight away it's not a case of scoring into the paper you just draw on those lines that are furthest away from the convention of the light you draw a secondary line on top of it quite hard like that and again at the side like that the whole idea of perspective is that it fools the eye it gets the eye to believe that there's something there that is actually in three dimensions okay so you've got your square that's the face that's going to be closest to you and you decide that it's going to be um, a box that's going to be receding away from you two squares along and again one two two squares along again one two squares along and one up like that okay so it's one up and two along one up and two along one up and two along and again you do the same thing you just draw a faint line a faint line between those points and another faint line between those points always remembering that the light convention is that it's going to come from the top left hand uh, sorry the top right hand corner of your piece of paper I'm doing this quite quickly because I couldn't find any paint to dry and then you draw on top of that line and now you've got a very accurate representation of a cube and again you think about the lights coming from this side so on this square this face you do a secondary line on top it's not a huge line you're not trying to score score right through the paper it's only to try and fool the eye that and again lights coming out this square so it's going to be that side on top just another line slightly harder and again this bottom one which is just the furthest away and there you've got a wire diagram that agrees with the conventions of the light coming from the top right hand corner Now that we've got our wire diagram, I'm going to show you some more things that you can do. And if we have the this face that's closest to us, what you do is on top of that line at the base, you're going to draw a hard red line. An accurate hard red line. And another hard red line, just at the inside of that. This is to emphasize the fact that with a lot of drawing it's about trying to fool the eye right and again if this is the second darkest you do another dark line this time in the face's color dark green and here in green so and at the top we'll have a uh, yellow So, and here, 
And even with those small lines, it does start to emphasise the fact that this is now a representation of a, of a three-dimensional object. So, I'm going to take uh, the yellow, start with the yellow first, and instead of doing a specific amount right across, you just do by the edge of the yellow line that you've just done. The even harder, even more um, emphasis is on the fact that this is the furthest away from the light. Okay, and then you do some more, which is slightly less hard, and you spread it out, and you do some more, and it's to the point where there's only the smallest amount of yellow in the top right hand corner. You do the same here, you do an edging, it comes around on top of that dark line, the same amount, and then you spread that out, so that when it comes to the top right hand corner, there's only the smallest amount of that colour there. And again, with the red, you do, and what you've got is the representation of three dimensions, purely and simply by shading. You spread it out, so that leads towards it, so that when it comes to the top right hand edge, there's virtually no colour in that place at all. And that hopefully should look like a three-dimensional object. Now, on top of this, now I've got to say when I first saw this, I, I didn't really fully understand the reason why you do this. But you have this top edge here. And on top of that top edge, you draw with a white pencil. I know that it might seem that you can barely see it in this top edge. But it does, with the eye's perception, give it uh, the, uh, the idea that this is a three-dimensional object. With shading, we always think that to shadow it, we have to draw exactly the same shape as we've already got. Well, that's not true, because what you do is, yet again, with the ruler, a dark line underneath the heavy line, and choose a, a dark colour. And again, underneath, just a single strong line and the colour that you've decided to make the shading with and on this side as well and you're not trying to draw a square underneath you draw, oh, sorry, you shade uh, a, almost like a border of a consistent strength all the way around This fades out, and you do some some more and further, not necessarily in a straight line, and hopefully that should look like a three-dimensional object. So let's take what we've got so far. This idea of colouring and shading and use of line to represent a three-dimensional object. Let's take it to use it in Jack and, Jack and the Beans talk. And now we've got a grid or a template which is a representation of a bean. And you really do want children to start using as much of a piece of paper as possible. So here we've got, uh, we have a, a picture of a bean underneath. So the children don't have to worry about whether they're going to draw it correctly or not because it's almost like tracing. They can follow the line of the bean that's underneath. And this is the growing area like that. Put it on like that. And straight away we've got a drawing of a bean. 
they can't say that they don't know how to draw it because it's there and it's underneath and again we're trying to work out that the light comes from that side so if you think about it from about here to there it's going to be darker so you draw on top of that light and it gets darker and you can fade that out and straight away that gives uh, an, a feeling of depth to our beam and we have it and this is where you can have shading now in the story of Jack and the Beanstalk it does turn around and say that the beans were many different colours so why don't we use that in our convention and we've got yellow which is going to be closest to it and green in the middle and red furthest away so let's do that so we'll have um, we're trying to think of the, the shading so this is a slightly curved so we can do some lines to show that it's if you think about the way that a bean looks it does have ridges on the side so we'll try and do our yellow so it's going to be quite dark here oops I'll try one that works like this one quite a thick line here so it curves round and then fades out there's nothing to say that you couldn't do this as we will do a bit later on with a variety of paints and then try and spread that out remember that this part here we're going to have green and remember the edge of the edging of the green is going to follow this it's going to be darker here curve it round here it's going to fade into that yellow Finally we have red, and why don't we do a hard red line on top of here, as well as everything else. Fade that out, so that it mixes in. Now we're starting to have something that looks, uh, if it was, I think that what I might try and do is just re-emphasize that red line again by using a filter pen on top of it. Figure that out. You've got a pretty colourful bean. I'll try and do this a bit harder here. And how long did that take? Just to try and show that you can use shading to try and give the emphasis on the three dimension three dimensionality. Of an object. It's not just the beans that we're looking at in Jack and the Beanstalk, we're actually looking at some of the figures. Well, one of a quick way of, of trying to think about uh, a human form is. It's an egg shape followed by circle, egg shape, circle, egg shape, circle, like that. And that is, it's not exactly a stick man, but this is the, the giant, as you can see, I've set like quite, quite strong shoulders. And this could be shown to the children to actually make the giant. Uh, or you can do what we've done before. Make it so that it's a template. And you've emphasised the body shape. And again, you place uh, a, a blank sheet of paper on top. And, and always, I don't know if you've noticed, but I've been using um, blue tack to hold these pieces in place. So you don't see all of the scoring and all of the, uh, the other parts of drawing. 
So you just draw on top of those lines, the muscles of the shoulders. I have drawn this giant with quite strong, uh, a strong muscular shape, but I've left the head and the face. And uh, whilst it's, it's good to use templates, you do want the children to feel as if they have some of their own input into the actual build, shape, uh, face and uh, body of the, of the giant. So there's an outline. Again, I'm using quite a, a heavy pen here, a pencil, sorry, 5B. Yes, there's his body shape. And on top of that, they can then draw the face. Well, if you think that it's a, an egg shape, and then they can draw um, a face, and they can draw the hands or the clothes. But they've got a mannequin, and they're not going to be spending all day trying to draw um, a man by then rubbing it out. Well, one of the things that I would like to be done would be not just uh, the actual shape or the, the body, but it is some of the clothes of the, of the characters. And here what I've done, uh, and if this actually fits over the top of the, uh, the shape, so if you want to become all Victorian on me, you could actually get the children to make it. But one of the design uh, aspects I would like the children to do is to talk about the way that the clothes are made. And through this template, you can see what it is that is going to go over his muscles and his shoulders. So like a jerkin or the, the fact that they're going to draw the thing that he has at his top, a shirt, a coat, I'm going to do something quite quick here and we'll make a, a jerkin coat on top of that, square shoulders. And again, if we look at this, we don't need the, the template underneath that. If you just look at this in exactly the same convention, you're looking at the light coming from that side. So that's going to be a harder line. And that's going to be a harder line. And that's going to be a harder line. And that. Ah, now this is where it changes. Because if you think about it, that's going to get the light first and this one isn't. It's just one of those things about um, the way that light comes on, on circles or shapes that are partially out of line of the, the light. Okay, so let's say um, this giant hasn't been able to buy anything by Yves Saint Laurent. So again, you're going to do something that's going to be a dark line on top of this one here. Like that. Same as we did with the cube. Same on top of this dark line here. Oops. Uh, it's a, an equivalent colour. <laughs> along here, same as we did with the, the cube, and on top of that line there, top of that line there, and again it's this thing all quite a hard line directly beside, the, uh, sorry quite hard shading beside the dark line you've just done, and again here, because I think that rather than the children just draw something freehand, if they have a convention or a, a, a means of understanding how they can represent clothing just by the addition of a few lines. And I think you'll admit that that does start to look as if it's a, a hard um, and a, an actual tangible piece of clothing. Again, this fading, the, the shading fades away as it goes across the body and away from the dark parts until it gets to the point where there's virtually no colour whatsoever. And at the side of this, at the side of this, I would like the children to uh, describe exactly what it would be made out of and perhaps put a, a swatch of material that they found. Uh, and they describe it directly. They talk about the kind of stitching at the side here. 
and so it'll be like cross stitched like here or they would show what the material would be made out of or perhaps there would be a design so this gives the children a chance to start giving accurate representations of clothing With the combination of colouring, with the combination of understanding where the light comes, when the children come to make a, 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 dis, a discernible drawing of the characters, I'll stick with the giant, uh, they can put their clothes on without having to actually draw the full body. So, with what we've just done and what we've just shown, we'll draw the shirt, how it comes down, how it comes down again. contours over the muscles, the clothes that he's wearing and here I'll just do it with a darker line and a darker line. Remember the convention of the light coming from the top right hand corner. All right and that's um, Let's go and draw some trousers. We'll, we'll see that they are cut off, cut off and worn away. So here we have this ne'er do well of a giant, this full body here. Now we've got what's underneath is the the line, the template, and could give him uh, something on his feet. Uh, let's have a little look. We'll draw. Uh, a pair of, of boots because that seems like the kind of thing that a, that a giant would wear laced and those boots come here what happens when you use a template like this for children who perhaps get themselves worked up into a frenzy because they can't get uh, the full proportions or they wind up thinking something's too big, too small and, or in the wrong place. You've got them taking to the task in hand, which is the giant. The hands, the clothes, the kind of person that they are. Well, we know that the hands are going to come down here uh, and the hands are going to have a thumb closest to the body and one and two and three and four. You can see why I use templates all the time. And one, and two, and three, and four, and five. And here is the neck. What you've done is you've taken away the, the, the chance of the children spending a lot more time rubbing out than they would actually drawing the giant. Well, it's a rough ellipse or an egg shape at the top here. Let's give them, um, let's think about the eyes. Well, if you think about the eyes, they're usually about the halfway mark. Uh, just an emphasis of a nose and a terrible snarl. Okay, it comes down. Ears and straggly hair. I always wind up saying the eyes had hair that hung over his shoulders. Again, here that's furthest away. And in a short space of time you can get the children now to concentrate on his clothing. Uh, let's give him um, we'll give him a brown a brown top. Hard dark line closest to the edge that's furthest away from the light. Again, like this. And to try and make sure that we combine as many curriculum areas as possible we've now got a chance for the children to feel as if they've drawn a good representation of a giant correct proportions there's no worries about rubbing it out 
and they can concentrate on the job in hand. Uh, let's give them uh, green trousers. Same thing, dark green line, furthest away, dark green line, furthest away. Must be another green. Green. <laughs> Very quickly drawn, and you've got the giant. Now, what I like to do is this is you've got by the side of the hair you would say long and greasy hair you would say um, mean green eyes so you could even do that in colour mean green eyes um, let's give them thin red lips uh, <laughs> a square mouth, thin red lips, cloth. What we're going to make this jerkin out of? Um, heavy woolen jerkin. Um, broad heavy hands broad heavy hands uh, green what would the could be made out of green flax trousers and when they come to write they have a representation of their giant in correct colours and it's easy to read it's easy to read and they start from the top of the head to the tips of the toes the head at the beginning of the story the body in the middle of the story the legs and feet at the end of the story one more thing about just drawing is when we come to ask the pupils to paint a picture of the house if they've had the skills shown to them or the techniques and the skills developed of using a template then they could draw a house using quite accurate following of a grid the front of the house the roof lines down the back of the house across like this and you can even wind up having eaves because you'll take it out just a little bit further and children will be able to get to use, used to this idea and the eaves will go out just a little bit further like so have the door and here you would have again the light coming from the top corner and you've got the children used to the idea of using a grid to make a conventional uh, understandable three-dimensional representation and again, if you look at it, that the roof is the closest, this, uh, well, this would become second and this would be the darkest. So you would make dark lines, along here, dark along there, like so, dark along here. And just by the use and the convention of a few lines, you're starting to get the children to use conventions that they can use for the rest of the design and technology career. All right, so far we've looked at drawing and how, can you, how you can use different kinds of tones to represent a 3D uh, object. What we're going to do now is we're going to look at painting. Now, hopefully you can see that there's a, a logical progression. We've gone from uh, using pencils, which is quite a, a manageable activity within the classroom, to start using paint. 
and I'm going to warn you now we're going to use nearly a whole drop of paint per colour. What I want to show you are some techniques that I've been shown that I've used in my own classroom and all you need is an old plate and if you have the, the solid blocks uh, of paint but what you do is you'll get the children to wipe the, the brush around uh, ten times so that they've got a full uh, brush load of paint. And what we're going to do is we're going to have no more than one single cup of water or a glass in this case. Children seem to have this idea that they need to clean the brush out completely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a number of techniques where you can use paint quite easily and what you're going to do is you're going to use this paint in different dilutions. It's easier to show you than it is to talk about it and I've got here a sheet of paper and what we're going to do is we've chosen, well I've chosen, three colours to represent the three different portions or the three locations in the story. Red for the red brick of the house that Jack and his mother lives in, green for the beanstalk of course and yellow for the gold that's at the top of the beanstalk, the golden harp, the golden eggs and the golden coins. And rather than get the children just to immediately splash paint on, and there's nothing wrong with that, but rather than get them just to splash paint on and start painting, let's get them to use techniques that they can use throughout the whole of their uh, learning career. And what you need to do is you need to take a brush here, as you can see, I'm using uh, quite a, a wide bristled heavy brush, the sort that you would see within a nursery, but this is equally usable within the um, key stage 2, key stage, key stage 3 and 4 and you just fill that brush, no more than that you're not trying to, to wallpaper the house or paint it so what you're going to do is we'll, you'll paint a shape well I'll, I think I'll just choose to draw a circle and then you take your water you place the brush inside and you shake it and what you've done there is you've slightly diluted the paint and then you draw around that, just slightly. Again, you put it in the water, shake any excess water off, and you go around, again, and you put it in again, and shake it off, and each time it's going to be coming out just slightly less thick, more diluted each time, put it in there, Shake it off. This isn't about cleaning the brush completely. And then you radiate out from there. Well, that is actually the middle of our story because using a, a number of media, we are going to use this as a background. So rather than go just straight from uh, white paper, we're diluting the, the paint so that it gives a sense of depth and just go outwards, it doesn't have to be that it's a circle you could have striped lines I will be showing you different ways of using this and here you've got quite a good um, use of darker to lighter which in many respects gives us a, a sense of depth well it just so happens that here's one I did earlier and here again Let's think about how we would have the, the red of the house. So you fill the same brush. You've only had one drop in it. It doesn't have to be taken to the sink. It doesn't have to be washed out. And all you've got there is one full head full of uh, paint. And this is about serial painting. And what you've got is, are the children, instead of having the paper, the slap paint on, and it's done, this is about taking some time and some care. Well, rather than have it uh, as a central point, let's say we'll try and put, well, it's, it's a square house, so we'll put a square into the water and a shake. And you can see that that water has diluted it slightly. Like so, in the water and shake. Again, each time one brush width as a stroke in that particular uh, concentration of paint. Shake it out. Put it in. 
like this and you spread it out and as I've said we've got different places represented by different colours and you shake it out spread it out on top and here's yet another one that I prepared earlier and this time what I've done is I've done the red of the of the house at the top I'll just shake this out it doesn't have to have uh, completely clean water each and every time well let's do it so we've got a full head of paint in the middle here so there's the red of the the house there's the yellow of uh, and I've done there's a triangle just to try and give some uh, different look to the whole uh, of this picture and what we'll do is we've got the full head of green here so we'll, we'll go back for that that yellow uh, the the circle so a circle in the middle here into the water and a shake once more into the water and give it a shake it also teaches the children patience patience in not having to have everything done at once you could maybe get them to paint two or three pictures of these different dilutions and by the time they finish doing one then the third one should be dry and another bit on top of that and like I say and if it's unevenly loaded on your brush that also gives it uh, a, a good strong effect again dipping it in the water spreading it out now a lot of the time children will not believe that there's anything actually on the brush well this has been shaken once twice three oh, six times and it is worth it just to keep spreading it out and even if it's just the water the water will have a slight tone to it. There you go, and a painting skill. And what we're going to do a bit later on is we're going to be drawing on top of this something from the beginning of the story, on top of this something from the middle of the story, and on top of this portion of the picture here we'll be painting something from the end of the story. Right, now taking what we've done so far, we've used three different dilutions and three different colours. Uh, and if you remember, when we were doing the drawing, we looked at how you could make the cottage. Well, you use the same technique with this. You've done the, the three cereal washers, and underneath you've got your grid. Uh, uh, children seem to have this idea that it's a good idea to try and draw everything in pencil on top of paint. Uh, and I've got to say, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with that but when all you can see are the pencil lines it seems to spoil for me it seems to spoil the painting so if you use exactly the same technique of having the grid and you can see the lines it might not come fully across in the DVD but what I'm going to do is I'm going to use some chalk to draw on top of this because what happens is if it gets in the way then you can always rub it off with your finger or if you use like a white chalk, I'm actually using a different coloured chalk so that hopefully it will stand up more. I can actually see the grid through the painting and through the washers. So something from the beginning of the story is the house. So I can see the line. So I'm drawing in chalk on top of this. The lines from the grid on top of this shape and down it goes to there. And I'm making go three across. So across like that and down and as I can see, as as I've said I can see the, the grid lines through the wash and there's the outline of the actual house well a few extra bits and pieces uh, perhaps a door and a, a window like that and if it's not quite right then you can draw another line underneath and I've got to tell you, I'm close up to this and I can't actually see that. Now, here we take the technique that we've had so far. Now, as it happens, I don't actually have any black paint. So here, 
I'm going to take a dollop of blue and a dollop of red. Mix those two together. A little bit more red. Now, with some paints, it'll actually make a, a, a purple. But I've got to tell you, in this instance, with these poster colours, it makes a kind of a sludgy black. And if you look, I'm using a, a much finer brush. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that. I'll just take that out of shot. I'm going to use that to make the outline of our house. Just generally. Because I'm drawing on top of the chalk lines that I can see. Across. For the roof. And so with the, the use of the grid, we now have an in proportion, correctly lined house. Okay, just going to add a little bit of water to that. Floor a little bit easier. Uh, there's the door. There's a window. And so, without making ugly lines that cut through the, the painting, well, what I'm going to do is instead of just using this brush, in exactly the same way as we used before when we were uh, drawing, I'm going to use a thicker headed brush here. And this is obviously uh, geared more towards the, the younger age range with using this size of brush, but the same principle goes with, with pupils of, a, of an older age. And what you do is you do those lines that are furthest away from the light. You do those thicker. And along here becomes thicker. And this one becomes thicker. And that one becomes thicker. And now you've got the same idea, the same principle that we had before of those lines furthest away from the light, giving it uh, a three-dimension a three-dimensionality. I will get to say that word correctly. Okay. And now, in exactly the same way, uh, I'll choose a, a, a darker colour to draw the outline of the beanstalk, which comes in the, the middle of the story. So I'm using a quite a blue here, and we'll have it so that it curses round and comes down. We're at the base. Um, leaves. Like I say, if they're not in the correct place, you can always rub that chalk line out. Uh, obviously, I'm using a blue chalk so that I can actually see this, but again, with a, a thinner brush, I'll take that. Just this, just wash this one out. Because there's so little paint in the brush, it's very easy to wash them out. Take in a bit of green. Do the lines that are furthest away, and the heavy lines. This leaf it would be that line, which is furthest away. Come round. That line. Furthest away. And now, with that serial progression that I've just shown you, on the leaves you do a line. And put it in the water. And another line. And then water, another line. Remember, this is going to be, we're going to add to this, and I would personally do the same with the, the beanstalk. Take 
your serial lines getting slightly thinner in this direction Oops. into the water and a shake out and the paint lines can't be seen in the water and shake out and again here And by the time you've done that with this beanstalk, remember we'll be adding other tones to this after it's dried. But if you look at this, the the outline of the uh, the outline of that cottage is actually dried. So now you've got the light coming in from the top. So you would have this is the lightest, the second lightest, and this is the darkest. Well, I think that would be. We're going to become extremely extravagant, and here we're going to use a whole second drop of red. Unbelievable. That much paint. Again, the same water. If anything, the fact that there are other colours in the water means that it's, it's got a little bit more character. Well, this is the darkest. And, and I've got to tell you, sometimes with children, and I'm going to show you a technique a bit later on um, about representing brickwork, where children seem to want to draw every last single bit of the brickwork. So we've got the line quite hard. Remember, it's further straight into the water. Check it out. That. And on top of the paint that's already there, you're going to paint this the darkest of all of them. Well, we said that the second lightest colour is going to be the green. So, I think I might need to use a second drop of green. This is such extravagance. drop of green here thick line there thick line across into the water give it a shake another line okay looks like that the lightness is going to be yellow so I just need to shake this brush out Some yellow, Take that in darkest line, furthest away from the light on top. Into the water, give it a shake, another line and across. We'll leave that to dry. I wanted to show you this this technique of using chalk to give you a guideline while you're painting. All of the cereal washes that you're using, they don't necessarily have to be this red, this green, this yellow. Here I've done red for the base of the beanstalk, where the house is going to be, and blue because it's the sky. And uh, I'm going to show you how you can use some pencils, and hopefully better ones than the, the last lot I used. To say the professional on the side, I don't know whether I'll get paid. But here you've got the red and the cereal wash going upwards that way, and the cereal wash for the sky going down this way. And again, I can see the grid underneath. Uh, I'll try. I'll try a darker, darker colour. Hopefully, you'll be able to see that. I, I can see the the grid straight through there. And again, to one side, following the grid lines, and down. You know, the chalk that's slightly off line, but that doesn't matter because just wipe the chalk away. And if you're using white chalk, 
then that's all the better. And again, here you could have a drawing, and I've got some a line, hopefully that's coming through. Cross along. And here you have the picture of the house. Uh, and again, it could be that you would use uh, different colours. Well, let's try with the same technique. And here I'm going to use pencil on top. So a straight line, straight dark line on here, like this. I'm just doing this freehand, just really to, to save time. Darkest in this corner. And gradually, in the same way as we've done the cereal washers, spreading out. So, and you can do it with the other colours as well. And here in the middle, you have a chance to draw the beanstalk. Again, if you use chalk, just to get the general proportions. Hopefully, you should be able to just see that. And then you have the beanstalk. And again, you would do it with a hard green line on the outsides, on top of the chalk. This saves all of the, the time that children spend rubbing out on top of paint. Uh, and I've got to say that once you've started rubbing out, then you've made it water resistant. And you have a, a final line on this side. And there's your beanstalk. It stretches out. And here, at the top, well, you could have perhaps the harp. I'll try a, a different colour. Well, shape of the harp and again I can see the grid through there swirling down uh, and I've chosen I obviously would not choose to, to do it in such a such a, a, a bright colour against that but again a hard line on here lighter there come down a hard line and a hard line like that it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, a harp and again it could be a coin or it could be the hen so it's just an element from each of the three parts of the story from beginning middle to end and uh, one, one of those things that I did say that I would talk about is the, the mixed media aspect of this well so far we've used quite heavy brushes uh, these really thick uh, and heavy brushes and there's nothing wrong with those but if you're going to try and do a little bit more uh, about uh, subtle work, well, what you could do is use a, a smaller brush, as you can see here. You have quite a, a fine-headed brush there. <clears throat> and use a colour to highlight the, the fact that there's going to be some shadow. Now, this is just going to be a small amount of the blue paint. And instead of shadowing it with, uh, with pencil... Let's try and use some paint and we'll draw a line by the edge of the house and a dark colour here. Maybe even a touch more paint along the bottom edge here. Just to follow the, the line like that. It's quite good that it runs out and into the water and shake. And you draw another line. Shake it out. And draw along that line and the water and shake it out and into the water and shake it out and it gives that impression of the house being a solid shape and in exactly the same way as we've used the cereal washers before. And what happens is you've got quite an interesting effect now because you have one cereal wash on top of another cereal wash. And you get mixtures and blends and the fact that the, the paper isn't exactly level. Now as you can see I've given the painting a, a chance to dry. It only took about 10 or 15 minutes uh, for the, the painting to completely dry. 
and as you can see uh, I'm really pleased with the with the way that this leaf has come out so that it looks as if this face of the leaf the underside of the leaf is facing towards the Sun with a dark line at the side some of the the paint is run but that gives it a more naturalistic effect and rather than paint another aspect where we have say just the the house and the beanstalk and here with the harp why don't we do uh, the egg and again as a guideline you can see that I've got the grid underneath the picture I'll use it a, a green chalk obviously when I was when I would be painting this myself I would have I would have used a, a white chalk but I'm using these different colored chalks just to uh, let you see where the chalk line goes Yes, I'm quite happy with that. That's a that's a definite bean, uh, definite uh, egg shape. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a felt tip pen. There's no reason why we can't use a mixture of washers, paint, pencil, chalk, because later on we'll be looking at how we're going to do the uh, the lines to represent the different bricks of the house. So here I'm going to use the felt tip pen, and as you can see, I quite like these felt tip pens, ones that have a wedge cut at the top because it makes it easier for you to do the, the shadowing to one side. So I'll start with just the point of the pen at the top and then sweep it around and as I sweep it around I'll let more of the face of this pen touch so that it becomes broader then I ease it up and becomes thinner. Join those thin lines up together And I've got a thinner line here and a thicker line there. Maybe I'll just emphasize that just a little bit more. Place the pen just a little bit more full faced. Yes, I like that better. Okay, so there's the egg. Well, we know that the egg is going to be uh, a golden egg. So this is all directly related to the way that we are going to be making the 3D paper eggs. But what I'm going to do is to try and represent that this is a golden egg rather than use gold. Uh, quite a number of schools I've been in have actually had gold paint, but it's very expensive. So rather than go to that expense, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a thick line in a, a dark orange. Closest to the edge, that's furthest away from the light. Thick edge, like that. And then, in the way that we've done before, more, but spread it out. The thing about shading is, if you do it light first, and then you think that afterwards that might need a little bit more, you can add more on top. So then we'll have a golden colour. And here I'm going to do the yellow. And again, this yellow is going to be quite a strong shading. And if you blend it in, all the better. And you spread that out. So that you have the shape of an egg. All right. Let's look at how we're going to make this house look more realistic. I've spoken before about how children like to draw every single brick so that every brick is put in. Well, there's a, there's a kind of a trick that you would use to get round that. And instead of drawing every single brick, you just draw perhaps a few edges. Maybe a half brick here. This is the, the multimedia aspect of it all. So instead of that laborious, uh, I suppose it's very therapeutic for the children. It also means they don't have to do anything. But uh, you just put in some lines to suggest that there is brickwork there. Remember, this isn't going to be judged by a builder. And in the same way as you do it so that all lines furthest away from the light are darker. If you notice, these ones are, 
are sort of like very heavy in this corner. These ones are just a little bit lighter. And there, without spending all of the time of drawing lines and putting crosses across it, just with a few intimations of T's and L shapes, you've got the idea that there's brickwork there. And exactly the same for the tiling. Just put in. And the beauty of this is, because we've used water that wasn't entirely clean, you've got quite a, a, a few uh, different shades of yellow in here. Maybe a line here. And the ones that are furthest away, you press a little bit harder with a pencil. And there you have, in a short space of time, quite a, a good intimation of there being brickwork and tiles at the top. You would do the same, uh, perhaps, with this aspect of the house. Remember, you're following the lines of the perspective lighter towards the top okay and as well as all of that so since we've used chalk already let's try and intimate the fact that there's a, a shadow or a, a depth to this house. Let's try quite a dull colour. And instead of using pencil or paint, we'll use chalk to intimate the fact that there's a shadow about this place. And you do the same thing. You do quite a hard line directly close to the, the base lines, the ones that are furthest away from the light. Line on top. Slightly lighter. And again, slightly lighter. And the best thing of all with chalk is you can spread that out so that it blends. And I think that you've got quite a good representation of a 3D house with brickwork in proportion. You have the light and the considerations of the way that the look that the beans stalk would look and the fact that we've already done something and now as I look at that I think I might just harden that on the on the egg just a little bit more so in reality this is very like the, the way that we did uh, the bean and there you have three aspects with the background representing three different parts of the Jack and the Bean stalk story There's just one last aspect of, of these drawings that I would like to show you and that is as well as emphasizing the shadow you can also emphasize the light. Well what I've used for that is a, quite a bright chalk. Here I've got yellow. If you think about it the light's going to come onto this house at the top here. So you draw with a line of chalk on top of that. Spread that out. It's going to come on that side as well. And spread that out as well. And on this wall here. You don't want people to look and go, oh yes, I can see that there's a line of chalk there. You just want to try and fool their eye to try and get them to think, all right, somebody's taken the time to consider how to make this into a 3D object. And on top of the leaf, draw with a line like this. Spread it out on this edge of the tr of the beanstalk, and down you go. A length to the bottom. Just spread that out. And all of these things are tricks to try and fool the eye into looking at something and thinking that there's something that tangible, something that they could touch, something with a certain amount of dimension to it. subtle line on top.
with the, the serial washers that you've been doing so far or that I've shown you, they don't necessarily have to be just a single point or several colours. They can be a single colour, multiple points and the way that they will blend and uh, join with each other. And here's one with two circles for red, a square and a circle in blue. Just a single one in blue. And as I said before, if you have this colour and it spreads out and spreads out, it gives a texture to the picture, to the paper itself. And rather than just use them perhaps to make up a, a multiple uh, aspect of the whole story, you could just take them and use printed sheets. Now these are all on the disc that goes with this. And what I've done is I've concentrated on uh, emotions that are used or experienced within the whole of the, the story. I mean, everybody's happy uh, at the end of the story. Uh, Jack gets lost. Um, sometimes he'll feel sad and perhaps frightened. And all of these are on the disc that goes with this. And to combine the two aspects of the serial washers and this printing. Now, with some printers, the, the, the lettering actually runs and it can be uh, something that adds a huge and I think a very uh, dramatic effect to the way that your painting looks. So with Frightened, it's certainly not a, a bright colour or a, a light colour like say yellow. So I've chosen blue. So let's make a almost like a, a downturned face shape to follow. Same thing, into the water, give it a good shake. And then again, you're almost trying to intimate uh, like a, a sad mouth face. Okay, and give it a good shake out. Spread this out. Oops. Into the water, shake out. spread out into the water and just spread it out and you can use this and it could be a point of discussion with the children to decide which lettering what type of lettering whether they should make it so that it's clear for everybody to look at when we're talking about um, inclusion whether everybody will be able to, to see that or whether they should use different colors and you spread that out and what I've done as I've prepared a, a, a few earlier. There's one for jealous. And I actually chose to write the word jealous in green. Because people say that they're envious or jealous and they've got green eyes. But you don't have to do that. I would recommend that you print these things out first rather than do the serial washers and then try and print on top mostly for the health and safety of your own, um, for your own printer. Okay, so we'll be using these a bit later on, but within the whole of the display, I think it would be very good if we had words that would just make people think about when they were sad or when they were happy or when they perhaps felt jealous. still on the theme of emotions to go with these serial washers and then the use of lettering what I've got are photographs of two masks now these masks usually cost about 45 pence to about 99 pence um, if from a, an art shop and rather than actually uh, try and draw myself I'm going to show you something that you can do uh, I took a photograph of this mask and what you do is you turn it over and you hold it up to a window or a light and then you can draw on the lines and as you can see I've used uh, in the same way as we drew the egg in the last painting I've used the felt tip pen to go around the outside and uh, a, th a thin pencil just to show generally where the mouth and uh, eyes and nose are and the same with this one 
And when you've done that, you've got a, a mask or a, a face that's in proportion. And what you do is you either photocopy that or scan it. I have actually scanned these and printed them out and made them into sheets. And now you've got sheets with the mask shape on. And what the children can do is they can choose one of these. They can choose a, a, a size that would go with perhaps a, a painting uh, that they've done of the jealous. And they could think of maybe drawing it or cutting it out and pasting it in that place just to show jealousy. Well, if they have difficulty trying to work out how to represent a facial expression that goes with an emotion, I've got this which comes from the internet and it's just some general ideas about how you can represent sad, happy, angry, sleepy, worried or surprised. And they can use this with the, uh, with the actual scanned and printed face masks and draw somebody who's perhaps worried or sad or frightened and draw it on top of this and use it, cut it out and then place it on top of the picture. So I've, I've chosen a, one of the masks that are on the sheet that you will get with this pack uh, and I've chosen one that I think will fit. I think I've chosen anger. If you just look at it in a cartoon form, you have a line that goes straight across for the eyebrow or the top of the eye and another line that goes across. These eyes are quite close set. And you've got a straight lipped. I'm not going to say if you take that. And it's as quick and as simple as that. You have this kind of anger, this face. Actually, as I've turned it over, I've got to say I quite like the, the reverse side. So I'm going to put it in like that. Put that in. Stick that on there. And there you have a sheet that's used serial washers, lettering and uh, some consideration of facial expression.